Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular lesson is a very interesting one, a challenging one, a remarkable one. It's lesson number eight for November 21 of 2015 entitled Josiah's Reforms. It's part of the series on the book of Jeremiah. I hope you have your Bible handy. We're going to look at several chapters in Josiah and look at a couple of other passages. So we'd like you to make sure that we're really quoting the Bible correctly. Before we all get started, however, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our loving Father, it's with great interest that we turn now to the story of Jeremiah and Josiah. That young boy who began his career so incredibly um, and then did such remarkable things. Help us to try to understand what impacted his life and how that might have some lessons for us as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jeremiah, and I'm sorry, I'm already making mistakes here. Somehow really I want to say Jeremiah and Josiah back and forth. Josiah began his reign as an eight-year-old boy. His grandfather, Hezek his grandfather Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, was a very, very wicked king for 50 years. He was then captured by the Assyrians who dragged him off with hooks in his nose and brass fetters, bronze fetters are on his, around him to Babylon, who, which was their temporary cap, uh, capital, and there we don't know exactly what happened, but he was released and allowed to go back home. And as some people might say, he got religion. He decided the time would come to reform his ways. In the last five years of his reign, um, he tried to undo some of the terrible things he'd done in the first 50 years of his reign. One wasn't, of the things. Wasn't he the one that uh, had, uh, the story goes, that he had Isaiah sawed? We're going we're gonna to talk about that in a okay. moment. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the awful things he did was destroying some of God's prophets. We'll, we'll read the actual recount in, in a moment or two. But Josiah, the one we want to really focus on here, uh, was his grandson. His son, Amon, ruled only two years, and then his eight-year-old grandson, Josiah, became king. And the Bible has some incredible words to say about him in, in 2 Kings 23-25 where I read, there had never been a king like him before who served the Lord with all his heart, mind, and strength, obeying all the law of Moses, nor has there been a king like him since. Wow. So, better than David. Well, that's what it sounds like, isn't it? At least as good. Yeah. Um, now, uh, yeah, can you uh, get me, we're, we're, we're studying about Jer Jeremiah, Mm -hmm. in this, this quarter. The, the full length of Jeremiah's life. So now, is, is Josiah popping up here in the yes. time of Jeremiah? So yes. that we got, we've got, uh, Josiah. Jer Jeremiah has all these, these, these terrible, doomful things to, to say about Israel, but, but Josiah crops up in here for a while. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and Josiah was about the same age as Jeremiah. Jeremiah was actually probably a few years older than Josiah. Mm -hmm. So you think about their lives going along more or less parallel. Uh, and so Josiah did all his wonderful things in the very early years of, of um, Jeremiah's life. And then things really deteriorated after Josiah. And those are the times when, when Jeremiah wrote most of his uh, predictions. Now, now was, uh, correct me here, was Jeremiah from a priestly family? Is yes. there some indication? He was, yes. So it's, it's possible that, that Josiah and Jeremiah might very well have had some intimate contact. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very likely. Yeah. So imagine that you're, well, we should say, and this may be very important to the overall story, his mother and his grandmother, we know almost nothing about them except their names. But their names indicate that they were God-fearing women. Now, you know how biblical names are. They often describe the characters of the people that have those names. 
So maybe that was what impacted Josiah to a considerable extent. We don't know. But here's Josiah becoming king at age eight, and obviously he's not fully in charge of whatever's going on. He's still learning. You know, this is a kid who's barely into primary school kind of thing, you know. But somehow, rather, fairly early in his career, by the time he was 16 at least, he is setting a course to reform things in the country of Judah, and later we're going to find out he impacts other nations in that area. Um, what do you think impacted him, the rest of you? You think it was his mother? Any brilliant suggestions that I haven't thought of? Well, I, I think, um, do we know how old he was when Manasseh came back? Okay. Uh, one uh, year old. Yeah, one, so, about one year old. So he could have been under this, quotes, yeah. converted man's influence. Yeah. Um, a man who was teaching his grandson, look, you know, yeah. maybe I've done some things wrong and there's a, there's a better way to do things. And when your time comes, you need to do things right too. Yeah. Well, one of the challenges in studying these Bible stories is that critics, and hopefully you don't run across them too often, but critics often suggest that a lot of these Bible stories are, yeah, you know, we don't know about those people, they really existed, etc. But it's very interesting that we actually have a hint of something from Manasseh here. Here is a seal that it was found, uh, and it says here in Hebrew, I don't claim to be able to read this ancient Hebrew, but you can see that the ancient Hebrew doesn't look anything like modern Hebrew. It was very different, different script there. Belonging to Manasseh, son of Hezekiah, king of Judah. And for those of you who know, look a little bit about ancient idolatry. At the top of the seal, you can see basically, a, a, this is very tiny, of course, a nude woman with two wings. That is the picture of Asherah, the female goddess part, partner of Baal. Um, and so that's his, that's his seal. I mean, think of what that says to us about his reign. Um, and she was the goddess of? Fertility. fertility. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. That's Manasseh, the grandfather. That's the grandfather so that finally reformed in the last five years of his life. Okay. So, um, Josiah lived his first six years, five or years so forth, under Manasseh, and then a couple years under Amon, his father, and then suddenly he's king. And if we had time, we would read all of Second Chronicles 33. It is a list of the incredible things that Manasseh did. I'll just pick a few of them. I mean, we can't read the whole chapter. He rebuilt the plague and places of worship. He built altars. Remember, Manasseh, in turn, was the son of Hezekiah, who had been one of the other, only few other good kings of, of uh, Judah. But he built altars for the worship of Baal, made images for the goddess Asherah, worshipped the stars, built pagan altars in the temple. We're talking about building pagan altars, inviting um, temple prostitutes to live inside the temple quarters. I mean, this is the Solomon's kind of, temple. Huh? Solomon's temple, yeah. That's what we're talking about. There were the most holy place and the yeah. holy place. and Well, probably they didn't live inside there, but, you know, right outside there in the it's courtyard. A, it's a big place. Yeah. He burned his own sons in some of the offerings. Yeah. I mean, he, that's... He built offerings to worship the stars. He sinned against the Lord, da-da-da. I mean, you just read on here. It's like, it's like almost X-rated, maybe triple X-rated. I, I, anyway... Having read the story of Manasseh, do you expect to see him in heaven? Of course, remember we said he reformed in those last five years. You, you could parallel him with Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, that would be a good I, parallel. I think there's a chance. You know, in the book of Hebrews, there's a chapter that lists some people there that you wouldn't necessarily think would, would end oh, up in, really? in heaven. Is, is his name in there? I, the I don't, end of chapter I, I, of Hebrews 11? No, yeah, it's not. I, do, I don't think it's in there. But. No. I'm going to speculate that Manasseh will be in heaven. Well, if so, what does that say to us about the love, kindness, and especially the forgiveness of God? 
Unbelievable, huh? Willing when to it, look at the direction that we're going. Yeah. Well, well why like does that? Why did that make a difference to him? I mean, we've all heard about the forgiveness of God. So does a lot of people, but that doesn't turn him. I wonder what what really turns him. <laughs> mean Manasseh? Yeah. Well, because he okay, he had right. a hook okay, in his nose right. and he was dragged off what three or four hundred miles to to Babylon. And, and with his arms and legs partially bound in, in, in bronze fetters. So that, that is what converted him? Well, he had hooks in his nose. That well, okay, that that's your attention. To be honest, I would say probably what converted him, he had a lot of time to do some thinking. Yes. And he didn't have any alcohol. He didn't have any fertility cult goddesses along with him or anything else like this. He had a lot of walking to do over a long way over through the desert hot and so forth like this. He had a lot of time to do some things. So he probably lived his life in a party all the time until he got pulled away and then he exactly. finally got dragged away from the party yep. and Did then he, he could figure out what's going on. Did he have a chance to uh, listen to any of the preachings of Jeremiah? We don't know. Manasseh? No, yes. no, probably not. He, mm -hmm. Jeremiah was too, too young in right. those days. Mm -hmm. Well, here's the story that someone just mentioned briefly. According to the Jewish tradition as recorded in the Talmud, remember Talmud is one of the expanded versions of ancient Hebrew tradition, Isaiah hid himself in a tree while fleeing from Manasseh but was betrayed by the fringes of his garment. The tree was sawn in half on Manasseh's command, killing the prophet. There's an echo of this account in Hebrews 11. Here's the references that you made. Look at this, Hebrews 11, 37 and 38 for just a moment. They were stoned, talking about what's happened to some of these famous biblical characters. They were stoned, they were sawn in two. Who else do we know that was sawn in two? Nobody. Only Isaiah. Only Isaiah. They were killed by the sword, they went around clothed and so forth and so forth. So they were chasing them and they happened to have a saw with them. That's kind of weird. I don't... It I'm could just, happen, but I'm just it's kind of weird. One can imagine the two men sitting down somewhere along the river close to the tree of life in heaven as Manasseh tells Isaiah the story of God's grace, how he was captured by the Assyrians and taken to Babylon where he finally turned to God and repented of his ways. He tried to imagine that scene. Manasseh was lucky he wasn't left in the field. The Babylonians are back in there when they conquered somebody they chopped, they could be alive, and they chopped their arms and legs off and left them to die. Yeah. This, this was the Assyrians dead. that were doing that, but they were worse. No real difference. Assyrians were, yeah, Assyrians were probably worse. <laughs> yeah, no, Assyrian, they, The earlier Assyrians, not, not at this point in time so much, but the early Assyrians, they would, they would capture people, especially people they were trying to resist being captured. Yes, yes. Beat them until they were black and blue and then skin them alive. Yes. Doesn't that sound exciting? Like ISIS. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in the New Earth, will Isaiah remember being sawn in two in that hollow log at the Order of Manasseh? Oh, yes, I would think so. Why but do not, you ask that question? What? Why do you ask that question? Well, I, I'm just asking what the real reason is saying, okay, how much are we going to remember? Yeah. Okay. If not, will he and we remember other aspects of the struggles on this earth, the battles and the great controversy over the character and government of God? If we don't remember anything, as some people suggest, what's the point of having the whole great controversy at all if we don't remember anything? There, there would be none. There would be none. I think we might forget things after being in heaven for a while. It might fade somewhat, but yeah. I think we'll remember. If Isaiah does remember, <laughs> what will he have to say to Manasseh? Glad you made it. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. That, that, would be, that would be very nice. Well, some, I wouldn't blame him if he had, took a little bit of time to cool off before he said that. You know, glad you're here. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, Ellen White says this about Manasseh's repentance, would, yes. Would Isaiah feel comfortable living next door to Manasseh? Uh, Manasseh? That's the question, especially if he saw him out in his yard trimming the trees with a sharp saw. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> but Manasseh's repentance, remarkable though it was, came too late to save the kingdom from the corrupting influence of years of idolatrous, idolatrous practices. Many had stumbled and fallen never again to rise. Patriarchs and, I'm sorry, Prophets and Kings, page 380. I wonder what does that. 
When do you get to the point where it's locked in like that? You get to the point where it's locked in when you just don't pay any attention to it. You're just on your way and whatever anybody else says, especially if it's contrary to what you're doing, you don't even listen. Well, and it wasn't just all Manasseh. No. No. So it wasn't that they could they couldn't turn back, it's just that they didn't want they to didn't. turn back. They didn't want to. That's right. Yeah. We know almost nothing about Amon, Manasseh's son and father of Josiah, except that his reign was worse than his father's, and he never repented. Well, back in the days of Samuel, the children of Israel pleaded for a king. You remember that story. They felt that the chaos in their nation was the result of not having any central leadership. We need a strong leader, right? Someone like, well, kind of like Saul, right? They were also very concerned about the evil ways of Samuel's sons. Unfortunately, Samuel's sons weren't doing what they were supposed to do. So they began to pray for a king. And a well-known preacher once said, be careful what you pray for, you just might get it. Thus, the Israel, Israel ended up with three kings, Saul, David, and Solomon. And that was not too bad up until the early part of Solomon's reign under the united monarchy and then the terrible slide just and destruction of the kings from the two kingdoms that followed. So Josiah now came to the throne at a time of great turmoil, apostasy and violence, and a time of threats from nations south and north. And again, Ellen White comments, from a human point of view, the divine purpose for the chosen nation seemed almost impossible of accomplishment. Prophet and Kings, page 384. The thing that interested me a little bit, uh, when you look at David, there's no question the man was a professional killer. You don't see much about that in Josiah, although he got killed by archers from the Egyptians, so you knew he had some military background, but yeah. there's very little of that, if any, mentioned. Yeah. Um, can you name another prophet, some other people who lived at that time who had something to say about conditions at that point? Was it Ezekiel? Was the time well, of Ezekiel, the time? Yeah. yeah. Ezekiel was over, well, a little bit later. Ezekiel would be a little bit later. He, his, his writing, anyway, was a little bit later. Over in, he was already overtaken as a, as a captive over into Babylon. What what about, about Hosea, was he? Hosea was 100 years earlier at the mm. time of the demise of the northern kingdom. But Habakkuk was one of the prophets who was active at that time. Look at what it, he says in his book. This is the message that the Lord revealed to the prophet Habakkuk. And his response, oh Lord, his, his comments, Habakkuk's comments, oh Lord, how long must I call for help before you listen, before you save us from violence? Why do you make me see such trouble? How can you endure to look on such wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are all around me, and there is fighting and quarreling everywhere. The law is weak and useless. Justice is never done. Evil people get the better of the righteous and show justice is perverted. How would you like to live in a society like that? We do. We do. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have both say that at the same time. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, you beat, I was good. I'm glad you beat me to it. <laughs> well, Habakkuk got the unfortunate news that things were going to change, but not for the better. The Babylonians were on their way. Well, look at 2 Kings 22, 1 and 2. I said we were going to look at several verses here. Josiah was eight years old when he became king of Judah, and he ruled in Jerusalem for 31 years. That's quite a remarkable reign. Uh, some of you might have noticed in the news that I think it's today or tomorrow, Queen Elizabeth II becomes the longest reigning British mon monarch in history. Might be today. Yeah. I think it's today. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, his mother was Jedidah, the a daughter of Adiah, from the town of Bozkoth. Josiah did what was pleasing to the Lord. He followed the example of his ancestor, King David, strictly obeying all the laws of God. You have the two names of the mother and the grandmother at, in quotes, paraphrase in English. What did they mean in Hebrew? Do you have oh. that info? Or? Um, 
I I don't have it readily are, that's available. That suggested that they were yeah. followers of God. Yeah, these are definitely uh, biblical names, not you know something from some other uh, background. Are these names that they hold on to since they were born? I have no way to prove that. Um, we don't, don't they kind of change like Saul uh, to Paul and that kind of stuff when when things happen to change their character? It's possible. Uh, let, let me just look. Give me just a second. Let me see if I can get that information for you. Um, well, certainly, uh, parents can have a profound effect on one's attitudes and behaviors. For sure, his mother did. certainly hope so. Yeah. But there, there could have been counselors, too, that Josiah had that uh, led somewhere, him in a good some, direction. Yeah, somewhere along the line, I got the impression that his, his aunt or somebody who was, and I, I don't, were there two boy kings? Um, yeah, Joash was another king. Maybe I'm getting Joash confused with Josiah, but it seemed like there was an aunt or something there that... Um, okay, here's... That, Intimate. Here's her name, Jedida, means beloved, and it's it's uh, the mother of King Josiah. Jedida is the means beloved, basically beloved of God. Well, the I H yeah. or Y H stands for Yahweh. Yahweh at it? the end. <coughs> so beloved of God would be the mother's name. Uh, beloved of Jehovah is yeah, what it has Jehovah. at the end. Yeah. Uh, let me see if I can jump over here and let's see what. Adiah means, again, you see the A-H at the end. Um, here we go. Uh, Jehovah, has Jehovah has adorned himself. Yeah. Jehovah says, yeah. That's a pretty nice name. Yeah. When, you, when you look at what happened to Moses, his mother had him for 12 years. I would, I would think probably Josiah's mother had him mm -hmm. fairly yeah. early on. Yeah. It's almost a given. Amazing how they can... With that ancient Hebrew, they can pack so much into just a few letters. Yeah, really, yeah. <coughs> one of the early, and if you look at a Hebrew Bible, you know, you, there'll be one line in Hebrew and there'll be four or five lines in English. Mm. Just consistently. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Oh, I'm curious, line. I suspect that mother, that Josiah's mother continued to have influence on oh, him yeah. Yeah. during his reign. Yeah. Oh, sure, but I think she would have been early on, probably where it started. One of the early things that Josiah did was to clean up the temple in Jerusalem. It's easy for us to think of Solomon's temple in Jerusalem as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, a beautiful building with the Ark of the Covenant inside and the other articles mentioned in Scripture. And we, we know that, those articles. You know, the, the table and the candle, eye, candle, well, the really lampstand. In the days of Josiah, the temple had deteriorated considerably. The building was in disrepair. Josiah realized that in order to institute a new kind of worship, he would need to clean it up. And so we can, we can read about that in verses 3 to 7. In the 18th year of his reign, Josiah sent the court secretary Shaphan, the son of Azaliah and grandson of Meshulam, to the temple with the order, go to the high priest Hilkiah and get a report on the amount of money that the priests on duty at the entrance to the temple have collected from the people. So first thing he had to do was collect money. Tell them to give the money to the men who are in charge of the repairs in the temple. They are to pay the carpenters, the builders, and the masons, and buy the timber and the stones used in the repairs. The men in charge of the work are thoroughly honest, so there is no need to require them to account for the funds. Imagine that. That would be a lot of money yeah. to make these repairs. <coughs> yeah. This was no small, insignificant... Un unfortunately, <coughs> Josiah discovered that it wasn't nearly as easy to reform the lives of his people as it was to repair the temple. And we always, I always ask, you know, how does this apply to us? Do we, do we need any cleaning up and repair of our buildings, of our institutions, of our hierarchy? Hmm. Well, you're getting kind of close there. To Be careful what I say here. But Josiah had the power to do the temple but he didn't have the power to do the people. Yeah. That's the real so. problem. Well, what happened as they were cleaning up the temple? 
Well, Shaphan delivered the king's order to Hilkiah, and Hilkiah told him that he found the book of the law in the temple. Found the Bible. Then. Notice the book of the law. Hilkiah gave him the book, and Shaphan read it. Then he went back to the king and reported, Your servants have taken the money that was in the temple and have handed it over to the men in charge of the repairs. And then he said, I have here, in those, in those days it would be a, a, a large scroll, I have a scroll that Hilkiah gave me, and he read it aloud to the king. And what was the king's response? Tore his clothes. When the king heard the book being read, he tore his clothes in dismay and gave the following order to Hilkiah, etc., etc. Okay? So, must have what does that tell you? It lost the Bible. Amazing. Yeah. And, the, the, and there were, remember that the entire tribe of Levi was supposed to be promoting the Bible. That's where they got their income. That was their means of support, etc. That's what they were supposed to be doing every day. Okay? Well, it was in the temple. They just lost it. Well, we don't know. You know, was this even maybe one of the original copies that were put uh, at the side of the ark, as it says, back by Moses? Or was this another copy somewhere in the, in, in, in the, play, in the area that was maybe in a back room or something that was, that was cleaned up and they found it? We just don't know. Well, Who how did? many years was that after Moses? Mm. This would be, Moses would be 1,400 and some, and now we're talking about 600. 600? So it would be 800 years later. So, so would it last that long? The, because well, they usually recopy awesome. those things. Yeah. So could it, were there times when, um, when Israel was attacked and they hid some of those things? Were there time, I, know, I know there were times when this occurred. Were there times before well, that is it possible that... It could have been a very bad time, and so they, they secreted those things, and then things were so bad that they... You're, you're getting ahead of our story. The, the, one, the one time when that's specifically mentioned in the Bible, well, sort of hinted at in the Bible, specifically mentioned by Ellen White, is at the, near the end of the, of the story of Jeremiah. Jeremiah and his friends, they saw what was coming to Jerusalem. And Ellen White says, Jeremiah and his friends somehow or other, and I, he, he, was a, he was a priest, so he had access, they took the ark and hid it, and it hasn't been disturbed from that day till this. That's Ellen White's comment. <clears throat> to paraphrase, it hasn't been found. It hasn't been found. When you look at the list of uh, tr tradespeople, the stuff they needed, it, to me that indicates part of the roof had fallen in at least. They wanted yeah. timber and binders, yeah. they wanted... Uh, yeah. Oh, it's, well, here's my question. Look at Deuteronomy 17, 18 to 20. What would have happened if they had followed this advice? And I quote, talking about, here's Moses predicting what's going to happen in the future. They're talking about some, someone becoming a king. When he becomes king, he is to have a copy of the book of God's laws and teachings made from the original copy kept by the Levitical priests. He is to keep this book near him and read from it all his life so that he will learn to honor the Lord and to obey faithfully everything that is commanded in it. This will keep him from thinking that he's better than his fellow Israelites. Imagine that. And from disobeying the Lord's commands in any way. Then he will reign for many years and his descendants will rule Israel for many generations. And what part of the, of the Bible would that have been? Well... The book of God's laws, so that probably talking the first five books. Probably talking about all of Moses' writings. Mm -hmm. Moses is talking about <clears throat> his own writings. So just Im imagine how things, how different things would have been if they had practiced that in the in the northern kingdom and in the southern kingdom. Or how how different things would be if maybe if our own individual lives mm -hmm. we did that. But but the point is that providentially they didn't. Maybe there's a message there. Providentially, they didn't do what? They didn't do. They didn't keep reading. Uh -huh. Maybe there's something else that needs to be done for them to keep reading. Like what? Mm, think about it. <laughs> <laughs> you're the one that you're the one that made the proposition here. What are you? Where are, you, where are you going with this? Well, it might be he might be showing us from this long distance of time. That we just can't keep the law. He might be showing us well, that. I mean, we keep 
going naughty naughty on those guys. They're just pig headed and all that, but maybe that's the whole point. Yeah. I mean you gotta you gotta at least consider that. Well Jeremiah I'm sorry, Josiah at this point in time is what, twenties, early twenties? He gave the following order to Hilkiah the priest, to Ahikam son of Shaphan, and to Akbor son of Micaiah, to Shaphan the court secretary, and to Asaiah the king's attendant. Go and consult the Lord for me for, and for all the people of Judah about the teachings of this book. The Lord is angry with us because our ancestors have not done what this book says must be done. Did he understand what the Lord's anger was all about? Oh, yeah. God has abandoned us, right? Well, look what happened. Very interesting. Hilkiah, Ahikam, Akbor, Shaphan, and Asiah went to consult a woman named Huldah. Why in the world would they do that? She was a prophet. She was a prophetess who lived in the newer part of Jerusalem, right there. Female. There were female. There were six other male prophets living around, not too far from Jerusalem, about that at, at that time. Or some of them may, we don't know exactly how early they took up their job. We know they were there. Some of them may have started prophesying or writing anyway later, but they were there. Maybe they didn't like what the guys had to say, and they thought <laughs> if they consulted with a Either female that prophet. Or, well. or the past, they've always gone to male prophets, and they thought maybe they'd try something different. <laughs> well, her husband Shalom, the son of Tikva, and grandson of Harhas was in charge of the temple robes. So this is a guy that's in charge of some really important things. They described to her what had happened, and she told them to go back to the king and give him the following message from the Lord. I am going to punish Jerusalem and all its people as written in the book that the king has read. They have rejected me and have offered sacrifices to other gods, and so have stirred up my anger by all they have done. My anger is aroused against Jerusalem, and it will not die down. As for the king himself, this is what I say. The Lord God of Israel say, uh, the, I, the Lord God of Israel say, you listened to what is written in, this, in the book, and you repented and humbled yourself before me, tearing your clothes and weeping when you heard what, how I had threatened to punish Jerusalem and its people. I will make it a terrifying sight. Jerusalem is going to be a terrifying sight a place whose name people will use as a curse. But I have heard your prayer, and the punishment which I am going to bring on Jerusalem will not come until after your death. I will let you die in peace. What do you think of that? Well, well here's Ellen White. It didn't quite happen that way, though, did it? Well, we'll not talk exactly. About that later. We'll, we'll, look at, we'll talk about that in a moment. Through Huldah, the Lord sent Josiah word that Jerusalem's ruin could not be averted. Ever since, I'm sorry, even since should the people now humble themselves before God, they could not escape their punishment. So long had their senses been deadened by wrongdoing that if judgment should come upon them, they would soon return to the same sinful course. So we suggested earlier that what was wrong with people was that they're just set in their course. It also kind of implies that if you threaten a person, they might turn good for a while until you pull back and they'll go right back to where yeah. they were before. So, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, and even all the words of the book of which the king of Judah hath read, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. Second Kings 22, 15-17, and quoted in Prophets and Kings 399, paragraph 1. The good news is that Josiah did not just sit back, down, and relax. Unfortunately, his great-grandfather, Hezekiah, when he got good news, he sort of relaxed and showed all his wealth to the Babylonians, right? But Josiah determined to do everything he could to try to straighten things out, not only in Judah, but also in the former kingdom of Israel to the north. He wanted to do what was right in the sight of the Lord. But in announcing the retributive judgments of heaven, we're reading from Melon White again, the Lord had not withdrawn opportunity for repentance and reformation. 
So here's a nation, think they have just been through 50 years of Manasseh. And is God giving up on them yet? No. <coughs> they still had an opportunity to, to repent and reform. Um, Josiah, discerning in this a willingness to, on the part of God to temper his judgments with mercy, determined to do all in his power to bring about decided reforms. He arranged at once for a great convocation to which were invited the elders and magistrates in Jerusalem and Judah. Together with the common people, these with the priests and Levites met the king in the court of the temple. And what happened? The Passover. Ultimately, well, the yeah, we're, we'll get to that. We're not quite ready for that. But Josiah called them together. He said, we're going to listen to this. And I don't know whether they listened to, if it was the book of Deuteronomy, whether they listened to the entire book of Deuteronomy being read. It's possible. It's possible. And Josiah said, I am covenanting, covenanting to return my loyalty to God. And whether he used any of his kingly authority or not, the rest of the people agreed with him. We will agree. Let's all return to the Lord. So what did he do? He started cleaning out the temple. And what did he clean out from the temple? Among, among other things, probably Asherah. Well, he removed from Solomon's temple of all the objects used in the worship of Baal, the goddess Asherah, and of the stars. He burned those objects and scattered their ashes. He removed the priests who had placed there, the, who had been placed there by the prior kings of Judah, and whose work had been to offer sacrifices on the pagan altars in the area of the temple. Those priests worshipped Baal, the sun, the moon, the planets, and the stars. That's what they were worshiping in Solomon's temple. After destroying the idol of Asherah, there you go. After destroying the idol of Asherah, he destroyed the living quarters in the temple occupied by the temple prostitutes. And I don't know if we need to be very graphic, but I can tell you that there were not only female but male prostitutes serving Asherah. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting that this kind of parallels a person who has been converted. Mm -hmm. they, they give up their gods. They give up all the things that used to be important to them, mm -hmm. and they give full allegiance to God. Mm -hmm. So cleaning the temple is like cleaning our souls, actually. Yep. Yes. I had not realized that it was that decadent in the temple itself that yeah. they had these temple prostitutes in the temple. And Asherah idols and all the idols to the sun, the moon, the stars, the Baal, and how right the there. In place of the stars, it says all the hosts of heaven. Oh, really? Okay. Um, and how did the Levites respond, number they one, to, to, to all of these other gods being in there and this. They were leading out in this worship. And second, how did they respond to... Uh, Reformation? Right, Josiah's... Uh, well... So the Levites were leading in both services? Uh, to Some of them Yahweh were. And well, both. I don't know if any of them were going back and forth. <coughs> Maybe. You know, <laughs> like I said, you know, this. It, we're all amazed about the building, mm -hmm. you know, being invaded by all this stuff, but it's such a good illustration yeah. about us inside, yeah. about cleaning out the things that are inside of us that block our worship to God. And so what did he do next? Well, and, and how when we become to the place where we need that, we may be very much like the priests that we have discussed, yeah. the Levites, yeah. not any different. So now, Joe, as soon as he's sort of cleaned up the temple, he starts working in the surrounding territories. He brought all the priests from outlying areas who've been conducting those pagan worship services. He brought them back to Jerusalem. Then he tore down the altars and tried to destroy every trace of pagan worship in the surrounding areas. Next, he destroyed the temple and the god Molech in the valley of Hinnom, where people had previously offered their, going back to Solomon now, had offered their sons and daughters as burnt offerings. Then he took upon himself the task of destroying the pagan temples and idols left by prior kings, including King Ahaz, King Manasseh, and even King Solomon. 
He desecrated the altars that King Solomon had built from, for his foreign wives on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, idols to Astarte, the goddess of Saigon, Chemosh, the god of Moab, and Molech, the god of Ammon. So this stuff's been going on since the time of Solomon. Yes, exactly. And how many years was that? Gary asked, you know, something Okay, different. this is 400 years later. So this has been Almost going on for 400 right. years? Yeah. No wonder they couldn't find the Bible. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but it was way worse in the north. Yeah. And then when the north is gone, it kind of, the worst of it, went, kind of moved down again. And by the time of Josiah, Manasseh and, and the people followed Josiah, there was this temporary lull, change, but they were even worse than the people in the north. What, we, this is kind of aside from our lesson, but it kind of fits in with the historical. What, what, the northern kingdom had, you know, fallen apart long before. What, what was going on in that territory okay. now okay, in what? the time of Jeremiah? That's okay, real quickly, I don't have a long time for this, right. but the northern kingdom, when the Assyrians conquered it, what they did is they took most of the people from the northern kingdom and scattered them out through their territories. And the reason for scattering them out, the idea was there would, be, there would never be enough of them together in one spot to mount a rebellion. Then they took people from all those other territories and brought them to what was the, in the, king, mm -hmm. the kingdom of Israel mm -hmm. and settled them there. And then they said to them, okay, you're now living in the territory that's supposed to belong to Yahweh, to Jehovah. Mm -hmm. So get yourself some priests from Jehovah and worship Jehovah. That was what they believed. They believed that gods were assigned to certain territories. Mm -hmm. So they actually sent for some Levites to come back, who all have been shipped off to some of these other territories, come back, please, and teach us how to worship God over here. And they did. And the Samaritans, that's, they, those are, that's what they ended up being called. Of this, Jesus' day. This mixture mm -hmm. of, of foreign people and, and, and <clears throat> Jews, there were still a few Jews left there, a mixture. Those Samaritans believed that they were descendants, they claimed to be descendants of Abraham, just like the mm -hmm. Jews. The Jews looked at them as being descendants of all these right. foreign tribes, and so there was a very different feeling about what their background was. So whether, the, whether the, was woman, the woman at the well in Jesus' time was a Samaritan yes. and could very well have considered herself to be a descendant of yes. Abraham. Mm -hmm. did. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, remember she said, our father Jacob. Mm -hmm. Remember? Yeah. Uh, well, Josiah scattered human bones over the sites where those idols had been, and that was a way of ultimately desecrating things. He then turned his attention to the northern territory formerly occupied by the kingdom of Israel and tore down pagan places, pagan places of worship there as well. He went clear up there? Went yeah. clear up there. And there's a very interesting passage, I wish we had time to talk about the whole story, back in 1 Kings 13. And that's way back just shortly after the days of Solomon. And I'm going to read you just the few, this, this first few verses from 1 Kings 13. At the Lord's command, a prophet from Judah went to Bethel and arrived there as Jeroboam stood at the altar to offer the sacrifice. He, following the Lord's command, the prophet denounced the altar. Oh, altar, altar, this is what the Lord says. A child whose name will be Josiah will be born to the family of David. He will slaughter on you the priests serving at the pagan altars who offer sacrifices on you, and he will burn human bones on you. And the prophet went on to say, this altar will fall apart and the ashes on it will be scattered. Then you will know that the Lord has spoken through me. Okay, how many years went by? He said about 400, 300. Yeah, well, 350, closer <laughs> to 400. Ellen White makes this very interesting comment in a, in a, a magazine that was written back in 1878 that few of us have heard about called the health reformer, few realize that in their lives they constantly exert an influence which will be perpetuated for good or evil. Hundreds of years had elapsed since Solomon caused those idolatrous shrines to be erected on the mountain. And why did Solomon build all those pagan shrines over there on Mount, the Mount of Olives? Pagan wives. Keep his wives happy. Keep his wives happy. So a hundred years have passed. He, um, he erected on the mountain, and although Josiah, now you see why it fits in our story, 
Josiah had demolished them as places for worship. Their debris containing portions of architecture were still remaining in the days of Christ. The prominence upon which those shrines had stood was called by the two-hearted of Israel the Mount of Offense. Not the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Offense. Incredible. That's Volume 2 of the SDA Bible Commentary, page is 1032. That a, is that a translation? Offense? I mean, well, is, that's what they... Is it, does it come from Greek or some... Hebrew. Hebrew? Hebrew. Yeah. So, Aramaic, probably. So, did it sound like that word, or is it I haven't. I haven't investigated that word, but mm. I, probably, very likely. Mm. So, finally, Josiah decided the time had come for them to restore the Passover service itself. And that's all. It, we, we, I don't have time to read all of it. Second Chronicles 35, I'm going to read the last few verses. King Josiah ordered the people to celebrate the Passover in honor of the Lord their God as written in the Book of the Covenant. No Passover like this had ever been celebrated by any of the kings of Israel or of Judah since the time when judges ruled the nation. Do you think a Passover like that was celebrated by any of the judges? Maybe, maybe something close to that in the days of Samuel. I don't think anybody else came even close. So you think this is a break in a record instead yeah. of kind of a restoration to what it was back then? Yeah. Hmm. That was reading from Second Kings 23, 21 to 23. After refurbishing the temple, it was certainly appropriate to use it for the purpose for which it was intended. That Passover celebration. Now, what, what normally happens in a Passover celebration? Just briefly. I have a meal. Yeah. Where do you do that? The night before, isn't it? You do that at home with your family. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And Josiah says, we don't have time to just do that. We have to come together as a nation, as a national family, and we're going to celebrate the Passover, all of us together. I mean, imagine that ceremony. Amazing. That Passover celebration was like no Passover celebration that had ever been offered since the days of Moses, as far as we know. The whole nation came together with the intention of starting something new, something that would transform the people of Judah. Well, do you think there's any need for that kind of stuff in our day? Well, like the other question is, did it hold? Yeah. And, and if it didn't, there's still something else that's needed. Mm -hmm. Paul had a comment about the people in his day that sounds a little like that. Look at 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8. You must remove the old yeast of sin that you will be in, so that you will be entirely pure. Then you'll be like a new batch of dough without any yeast, as indeed I know you actually are. So when was it that they eat, ate the, the loaf without the yeast? We know about the, the the unleavened bread. The unleavened bread. Yeah. Passover time, right? Yeah. Exactly. For our Passover festival is ready now that Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us celebrate our Passover then, not with bread having the old yeast of sin and wickedness, but with the bread that has no yeast, the bread of purity and truth. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 and 8. So, unfortunately, that's not the end of the story. What did Josiah do? Well, things were really rumbling in the world around him. And the Babylonians were rising to power, and the Assyrians were deteriorating, and Egypt thought the time had come. King Necho from Egypt decided the time had come for him to get back into things here and see if we could reassert, reassert Egyptian power. And so he's headed up to going alongside the southern part of, of uh, Judah. And unfortunately, Josiah decided that he needed to go out there and try to oppose him. And what happened? He was struck by an Egyptian arrow and killed. He was disguised. He was disguised. But he must have sent messages to Nika because he got a message back. Yeah. What have we got to do with you? I've got to yeah. fight someplace else. So it looks like if he were to just let him go, there yeah. wouldn't be any trouble, at least during that time. Well, we read that Josiah was supposed to die in peace. Yeah. Look at this comment again from Ellen White. 
but at the last he died in battle. Why? Because he did not heed the warnings given. And there's the warnings. We don't have time to read them right now, but because Josiah died in battle, who will charge God with denying his word that Josiah should go to his grave in peace? The Lord did not give orders for Josiah to make war on the king of Egypt. When the Lord gave the king of Egypt orders that the time had come to serve him for, by warfare, and the ambassadors told Josiah not to make war on Necho, no doubt Josiah congratulated himself that no word from the Lord had come directly to him. To turn back with his army would have been humiliating, so he went on. And because of this, he was killed in battle, a battle that he should not have had anything to do with. The man who had been so greatly honored by the Lord did not honor the word of God. The Lord had spoken in his favor, predicted good things for him, and Josiah became self-confident and failed to heed the warning. He went against the word of God, choosing to follow his own way, and God could not shield him from the consequences of his act. In this our day, men choose to follow their own desires and their own will. Can we be surprised that there is so much spiritual blindness? You can read about that in Volume 2 of the SDA Bible Commentary, page 1039. So prophet, prophets had told Josiah, don't go down, or was it just advisors that had told him, don't go and oppose I don't oppose know if we Nico. know that for sure, but apparently probably prophets. So don't go and oppose Nico, just let him go. And Nico said, Leave me don't, alone. Leave me alone. I'm not after you. I'm after those guys. Yeah. Babylon. He went out there anyway. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty sad that such a shining light died at the age of 39. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to note that Josiah's reforms were basically the undoing of all the evils put in place by his father, grand, his grandfather Manasseh and his father Amon, largely. Of course, there were still traces of pagan temples and other remnants of heathen uh, forms of worship, as we noted, some even from the time of Solomon. One of the most significant parts of this story is something we've just hinted at but haven't really talked about, but we need to get to it in the last few minutes we have. What was it that led to that massive reform? Reading the Bible. Reading the Bible in public. You know, Ellen White says we would do very well have some church services when a person who is well qualified to read a passage from Scripture would get up and spend the entire church service just reading from the Bible. Now we can do that right now listening to it on the internet. Yeah. So that would do the same effect, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, presumably. Presumably. Yeah. It's interesting that, go ahead, Gordon. <coughs> that would be one by one instead of. Right. A whole church mm. together. Yeah. Does it matter? Well, it can, it can, there, there yes. may be some benefit from hearing it as a group. Yeah. Well, I can't argue with you there. But. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that 230 years later, after the Babylonian captivity, after a whole bunch of things, past the time of Esther, etc., Ezra and Nehemiah did what? Read the Bible to the people. They read the Bible to the people, and the story is told in Nehemiah 8 to 10, and there was a, and that time, at that point in time, they no longer spoke Hebrew. They spoke the language of Babylon, Aramaic. Hebrew now, was a dead, dead language by that time. Hebrew was almost a dead language. So, so but, but Ezra stood up, he read it in Hebrew, the, his friends, he had like 12 of them on each side of him, they interpret it to the people in Aramaic. Would that be the first modern language translation? Sure. Sounds like it. Yeah, on the fly. <laughs> yeah, on the fly, right. Well, how much reform would we get if we went to a church or even downtown somewhere and stood up and read the book of Deuteronomy? We used to do something like that in our hymn books. They always had scriptural verses in the back. The minister read one, and they're the still there. Congregation, I remember that vividly. I haven't heard that for years. So the answer to that question, <coughs> what would it do for us if we found that answer? Well, if we had, if we had some, the kind of response that they had in those days, it would be remarkable. Do you think you would get that kind of a response? That's my question for you. I think, it's I, I think people will look at you and laugh at you in our day. 
Okay, they so what's the difference? What is, what is the difference? That's what I'm asking. Why did the why did those wicked we, we look at these people and say, Oh, those terribly wicked people, look what they're doing in the temple, Solomon's temple, blah, 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 blah. But when God's word was read to them, they reformed. And later when Ezra read it again, they Ezra reformed. Ezra read again. it again, they reformed again. And today it's we're not wicked like those people, right? It's kind of a cycle. You lose your focus, you regain your focus. Well, it I don't know goes if, on. if you saw like Haley's Comet coming towards the earth and you're wondering if <laughs> what's going to happen, well, then if somebody starts reading the Bible, I bet you people would start listening. Josiah had read to priests and people the book of the law found in the side of the ark in the house of God. His sensitive conscience found in the side of the ark. This is from Ellen White. That's where Moses was supposed to have kept his original versions. So maybe this was one of Moses' personal handwriting. His sensitive conscience was deeply stirred as he saw how far the people had departed from the requirements of the covenant they had made with God. He saw that they were indulging appetite to a fearful extent and perverting their senses by the use of wine. Men in sacred offices were frequently incapacitated for the duties of their positions because of their indulgence in wine. Does that remind you of anybody? What about Aaron's sons? Samuel's sons. Nadab and Abihu. Eli's sons. Samuel's sons. And all of them were disasters. Appetite and passion were fast gaining the ascendancy over the reason and judgment of the people till they could not discern that the retribution of God would follow upon their corrupt course. Josiah, the young reformer, in the fear of God, demolished the profane sanctuaries and hideous idols built for heathen worship and altars reared for sacrifices to heathen deities. Yet there were still to be seen in Christ's time the memorials of the sad apostasy of the King of Israel and his people. Well, as we have noted before, the people of these two kingdoms, Israel the north and Judah the south, seem to follow almost unthinkingly their rulers. Why did they do that? Do we do any better today? Are we more inclined to think for ourselves? Maybe a little bit. Well, but sometimes I, think I wonder if they really did take time. Yeah. 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 Well, we're out, of, we're out of time. So, hope you've enjoyed the discussion. Think about how things would be in your church if the book of the law was read. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for the privilege we have to meet like this and to represent you the best we can through these words. Forgive us where we may have been lax in reading your word and taking you seriously. May we learn from these lessons. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.